Welcome to our course on Moduli. Welcome in the new year. Thank you for joining me here in, on the light board. So <clears throat> the semester in Austria will go still for three weeks until end of January. So we have three sessions. But uh, I want to go slowly and I probably will not be able to finish with all the material. So I think I already wrote to you that maybe we make a continuation, a short continuation in March with some more items. It depends also on your interest and whether you keep you keep be keep joining me in this uh, endeavor. So <clears throat> with the new year we will start also with proofs. And the proofs will be elementary, but we need a little bit, we need uh, a feeling what's going on. So I will <coughs> start today with a recall on the situation where we are, and then we will start to prove the first things. Are there any questions from your side? Did you, did you get the, the lecture notes I sent you of the last few lessons? Yes, thanks. Okay. And um, if you have any further questions, just contact me or send me an email. Okay? So <clears throat> let, me, let me just check a little bit. Yeah. Perfect. So let's just start with the recap. So there were three weeks of, of break. So let's refresh a little bit what we are doing. So we defined n-gons, x equals x1 up to xn, n points in P1. So we write it as a vector, and it is an ordered vector. And we call the xi the entries of x. And the set n, 1 up to n of indices. And we call the indices labels, because they will be the labels of our vertices in the phylogenetic tree. And it could be any, any set n, of course. So whenever we have such an n-gon, we can associate to it associate to x its incidence partition so this is a, part, a set partition of n i1 this joint ik where ij collects the labels I with equal entry xi. Okay. So <clears throat> for a generic n gon where all entries are pairwise different, this will be just uh, or each ij will be a singleton consisting just of one element. But the interesting part is of course when some entries come together and become equal. Okay, and the, these sets ij, I will call them the incident sets of x. Okay, so that's a combinatorial and very simple combinatorial information. Then we had also what we denoted by t, i, j, k, and we wrote n over 3, the set of triples. And here, we will always assume that they are ordered increasingly, whereas for the quadruples ij, kl, and n4, this is a set of quadruples, and we don't order them okay, increasingly. And then, <coughs> uh, i, j, k, l in brackets denotes the cross ratio of 
z. Now z is a variable, a vector of variables with respect to i, j, k, l equal q. So I denote this as cross q, z. And recall, I think that's the tenth time that I am writing this down, but it doesn't matter that i minus z k times z j minus z l divided by z i minus z l z j minus z k. So this is an element of the fraction field of the field of rational functions in z i. And we can evaluate uh, this cross ratio in x, so x in P1n, then we have cross Qx in P1 is defined if no three entries xi, xj, xk, xl are equal. If three are equal, then that's not, this doesn't make sense. So here we use the usual rules of computation in P1, taking P1 uh, as P1 as usual, as uh, the ground field k and with some element at infinity, and the usual algebraic rules for computations. Okay. Now, if, if these four are pairwise distinct, if xi, xj, xk, xl pairwise distinct, then the cross ratio of x will be any value in p1 except 0, 1, and infinity. We have seen all this, so I, I'll be rather rapid on this. And when do we get, these are, would be the special values. And they correspond to the equality of entries. So the cross ratio of x is 1, precisely when x i, the first two are equal, or x k equals x l. So both, we can have two pairs of equal numbers. This doesn't matter, OK? And uh, cross q of x is 0, and always meaning that no three are equal, of course. And uh, here we have x i equals x k, or x j equals x l. And the cross ratio is infinity in the remaining case, xi equals xl or xj equals xk. So that's, that's the funny thing of cross ratios, that we can read whenever they take a special value, we know which entries are equal, but there's an ambiguity here. Yeah? We know it is one, either this or this or both. So here we have a certain ambiguity about the equality of entries. And that's precisely where the game will start. Otherwise, it would be boring. But this will be, I hope, a lot of fun. OK. Now, we have, of course, PGL2 acts on P1n. And it is clear if x is equivalent to y, PG, PGL2, then now this action on p n n p one n is of course by automorphisms of p one to the n. So an automorphism will of course uh, maintain equality of entries and also disparity of entries. So it's an immediate consequence of having an action that then the cross ratios are equal. Cross q x equal 
cross q y for all q in n four, and whenever they are defined, whenever defined, whenever both are defined, okay. But the converse is not true. No? Uh, converse does not hold. So here we just use that the cross ratio is a PGL2 invariant. Cross ratio is a PGL2 invariant. My argument was uh, misleading. It was not the, that it, the PGL2 action preserves equality and inequality. Here we just use the invariance. But I want to say that if we write now for <coughs> these uh, incidence partition uh, as follows, let i x and i y be the incidence partition, incidence partitions of x and y. So we have set partitions of n. Then, because having an automorphism, then x equivalent to y will imply that ix is the same as iy. Okay, we have seen this already. And what we will prove today is that this is actually an equivalence. Today also holds. But for this we need we need an assumption. We need of course that the cross ratios are equal, provided that cross xy, oh, but that's stupid what I'm writing here, sorry. Cross q x equals cross q y for all q in n4. So by the way, I will type again what I'm doing in these three weeks so that you have it. Of course, you can take notes, but you will also get it written down carefully. Okay. So this also holds, and that's that's now. It's not completely obvious. Yeah, it's tricky to prove it. Not very difficult, and it shows the following: that here these are just combinatorial objects, no partitions of the, the set n from one to n. No. So the but the PGL two action having the same orbit or being equivalent, that's a more, I mean, that involves an existence quantifier. Namely, you need an element in PGL2 sending y to x. And here you eliminate the existence quantifier by just comparing, by just comparing the incidence sets. So that's what you could call a quantifier elimination if you want to do. Quantifier. Elimination. It's a very simple type of quantifier elimination, but whenever you can quanti el eliminate quantifiers, you are on the good side in mathematics. Okay? Any questions so far? You remember a little bit what, that all this was already done? Can I erase? So maybe those who, of you who are particularly curious, maybe they tried to prove this converse implication already during the Christmas break. Uh, <clears throat> because that's the funniest thing if to, to try it on your own. I remember when, when I proved this, or when I proved this together with Josef Schicho and Sayuki, 
we were really very astonished how things worked because it was a kind of new, new type of reasoning for us. So before going into the proof, we need a little bit, we need some more uh, concepts. So we had a few more things. We had something which we call symmetrization. Of course, I'm repeating this now for the nth time, but to have everything together. So we denoted by un the x in the n-gons with pairwise distinct entries. Then we had m0n, which was un mod pgl2. So these are the orbits or equivalence classes of n-gons. And then we had this inclusion into something we called Zn. This was sitting in P1 to the n times n to 3. And what was this Zn? So this is what I denoted by Xi n. Here we, we took, I wrote, this, the elements here are called strings strings of n-gons, OK? And in Zn, we consider those. Now we write them, of course, as xt indexed over all triples n over 3. And Zn are those where we require if t is i, j, k, then we require that xt i is 0, xt j is 1 and xtk is infinity. OK, so this is all this goes together in the definition of this subset. And how does this work? We took x, uh, an n-gon, x1 up to xn, and we send it to the string x of all xt, t, in n over 3, where each xt, so this would be in Zn, and of course xt equivalent to x. So xt is a unique, the unique n-gon equivalent to x with this property here. This was a symmetrization map, and it was an injection and embedding into this space, and of course we end up with the image. So that's something we called Vn, was the image xi n of m0n, which was also, <coughs> I called it sigma n of un. And uh, this is contained, sorry for the notation, but we need a, a bunch of objects. Yn were the strings. Yeah? So this is a set of x equals xt, t. So I hope that you see a little bit that everything is quite natural. It's a little bit complicated, but it's very systematic. And these are the strings, yn. Of course, when we go here, the, the cross ratios of these xt will all be the same because they are equivalent to x. So here we require that cross Q XS equals cross Q XT for all Q in N4. OK? I, I hope you see a little bit how our letters work. This was UN, the image is VN, here we have YN. And, uh, then we have also 
this is our last object xn, which is the risky closure. And by continuity, we saw already that this is contained in yn. Okay. So uh, already here we can make an interesting remark. Yn is given by polynomial equations. So Yn inside P1 n times n over 3, this will be a closed algebraic subvariety. Closed algebraic. Yeah, because we have equations. Xn is also closed. Yeah? But xn, we don't know the equations yet. Afterwards, when we prove that both are equal, we know that the risky closure can be defined by these equations here. But one thing which is clear is the following. xn will be irreducible because un and is irreducible. Okay, The image is again irreducible, so no. xn is irreducible. And uh, once we prove here the equality between xn and yn, we know that yn is irreducible. And as this xn will be later on, we will prove that as xn is isomorphic to m0n bar, the this is the delin mumford knudsen compactification. Yeah. We get a proof, so this will be also yn. We will get a proof that this space here, this moduli space, is irreducible. And that's a big theorem by delin and mumford in Publication Yeshues, something like 50 or 70 pages. Okay. So we get in this way already the irreducibility of the modular space. Of course, I have to add that we are looking here at a simpler case because we are only looking at curves of genus 0, only P1s. Knuts, uh, Delin and Mumford are considering here also curves of genus, of higher genus. But at least you see how things fit together. OK? And uh, one thing we will prove, but that's uh, so this equality first. This equality here between xn and yn, that's not so easy to prove. Yeah? Because these equations are rather complicated. Yeah? But it will follow. At the end, we will need a bit of time. The other thing which will be earlier, we will prove that uh, xn is smooth, or maybe yn is smooth. I think we prove it first for yn. Yeah. So moreover, xn equals yn are smooth. And to prove the smoothness, which is also, now this smoothness is part of the work of Knudsen. Knudsen was kind of student of Mumford. So, the smoothness will use and exploit the structure of phylogenetic trees. Okay? So that's already one instance which is, makes a kind of commercial for phylogenetic trees. This was symmetrization. Now, I think I need, before we can go to the proofs, I need two more recalls, and then we are done with this. Is this clear up to now for everybody? So now we decided to look, instead of n-gons, we looked now at strings x, which have many n-gons. And we will also define the incidence graph. Uh, sorry, the, yes, we will now define the incident position or the incident graph of a string x. So incidence graph of string x, and I will take it in yn. So for the moment, 
we, we neglect here xn. Yeah? So we just assume that the cross ratios of all the n-gons of x are equal. So this graph, uh, which I will denote gamma x, will consist of vertices and edges. It's a finite graph. It will be a phylogenetic tree, as, we, as you know already. So v, we will have inner vertices. Uh, and outer vertices in V. The inner vertices will be formed by the orbits of xt. So x will be, again, a vector of n-gons, as here. And we take orbits of n-gons of x. So we have many, many n-gons here, and some of them may be equivalent on the PGL2. Some of them might not be. Okay. In, general, uh, <clears throat> in general, we will have some, some orbits falling together when we look at their equivalence class. Okay. So the number of these orbits is completely unclear. It could be huge. It could be small. Of course, if we, if we would start with an string x, with an n gon x, with pairwise distinct, with pairwise distinct entries, then we would get just one orbit because all x t are equivalent to x to each other. Okay. So maybe I should write this like this. Uh, uh, just one vertex. If x, let me call it generic. Generic meaning it comes from un. Okay. The outer vertices will be called leaves. And they are just the labels i in n. So I identify the vertices with the leaves. Sorry, I, we identify the leaves with the labels, or we put the, leave, the label at the leaf. We have seen pictures of this. And then we have inner edges. Inner edges correspond to edges between inner vertices. So <clears throat> xt and xs are connected by an edge. If now we go to xt and xs and their incidence partition, if their incidence partitions share a complementary set. So <clears throat> let me write it like this. We have exists i in i x t exists j in i x s i this union and j is n. Okay, that's the rule to connect, and that's of course the critical step in the whole construction. And then we have the outer edges connecting a leaf to a vertex. Outer edges. So what do we do here? Attach a leaf i to a vertex xt if xti is a singleton. of xt, which means, I hope you remember, that the set i is, so xti is different from all others, so this is in i xt. In principle, there could be several orbits having uh, this singleton, but we will prove later on 
that actually there's a unique orbit xt, so a unique vertex where this leaf will be attached to. Okay. So to refresh your memories, let me see if this works. Let me draw again. In blue, here we are. in blue, the inner vertices, the orbits, and here i, j, k, and here we would have x, t, x, s, and so on. Okay. I hope everything is clear. In any case, you will have it also in the notes. Now, now what? Uh, I don't think I have to remember what is a phylogenetic tree. I will just do it uh, in words. A phylogenetic tree is a finite graph without loops as we have it here. And there are two rules. Uh, yeah, there are no loops and there are no vertices of degree 1. Uh, of degree 2, sorry, I'm mistaken. So, the leaves here, they have degree 1 because they just have one edge. And as you see, the blue vertices, the inner vertices, they all have at least degree 3. Okay, That's precisely the definition of a phylogenetic tree. So here, for instance, we even have degree 4. Yeah? This can happen. But here, where we have degree 3, we are not allowed to, to, to skip this leaf. We need, as we just have one blue edge, we need at least two leaves here to have again degree three. Okay, this was the warm up for today and for the new year. And now I would like to prove something. At least I will write down the statement of the lemma, the first lemma of the class. And then, <clears throat> uh, after the break, we will proceed to the proof. So I'm, I'm not sure if all these details which I and the notation, if it's not too much for you because it might be easy to confuse everything. So in the proofs, I will go slowly and I will do a lot of pictures so that you really see what's going on. So let me, let me start with the lemma. This could be an exercise, but uh, I will point it out. So <clears throat> this is on phylogenetic trees. So this is a characterization of phylogenetic trees. And we will use this characterization in the proofs later on. So uh, let n be a finite set of labels. So what I will do, I will construct from a phylogenetic tree a collection of partitions. And then conversely, from a collection of partitions with certain properties, I will construct a phylogenetic tree. So this goes in two steps, A. Let T equals VE uh, phylogenetic tree. 
So uh, the cardinality of n is, of course, n, with n leaves and label set capital N. So ah, I erased my picture. What I want to do is I need it again. I will make a simple, simple phylogenetic tree. We want to define several partitions. So maybe I call this here V. We did this in part already. And then we have edges E, F, G, H. So we define define partition I V. So this will be a, a set. Yeah, of partition of n. So how do we do? We take we take an edge starting at v, and we take all the leaves which we can reach here. So this will be one set. So this will be i v f subset of n. Here we will have i V E. Here we will have I V H. Ah, I was no 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 no. I missed my leaves. Okay. And here we will have I V C. So this is what I call the destination set. of V leaving, you remember the example of the train station, in direction F. Now when you go, when you start in V, you go along F and you continue, then you can reach these leaves here. That's the set, and that's of course a partition of N. Okay. And the, the converse constructions, let I V excuse me here. I want to correct this here. Let me write this. I want to distinguish the inner vertices from the leaves. So I write the vertices directly as V union N, and this is of course V is the inner vertex. to keep the notation simple. Let I V, now we take a, a set of partitions of N, be a set of partitions of N, some finite index set capital V, and with the following property, with so v is finite. Uh, the first condition is write it here. Each of these partitions has at least three sets. Second one, that's the most complicated, for all i in i v, there exists a unique u in v exists a unique j in the partition of u such that i j is n. And the third condition for all i in n, there exists a unique v in v such that 
the singleton set I belongs to this partition IV. So something, a set of partitions with these properties will be called an arboral covering of n. I don't found a better name. If you have any suggestion, please let me know. OK, so that's, these are two constructions. And uh, then the statement of the lemma is <coughs> what we define in A uh, the construction of A defines an arboreal covering. defines an arboreal covering of n, b the construction of b. Ah, oh, I did not give the definition. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. I missed the construction here. Uh, I can do it here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So I want to define a phylogenetic tree. And this goes as what I will define here. Define a graph gamma equals v union n and e. So the n is already given. v is already given with uh, so V gamma is V union N. And the edges of gamma, I denote them as VW between two vertices, uh, inner vertices in V, precisely by condition 2, there exists an I in IV, exists an J in I. W I disjoint J is N. So these are the interesting. And uh, we take I and V precisely as in condition S in. So we connect I and V if V is a unique vertex with this property here. Okay. So the constructions of B as defined here define a phylogenetic tree. And of course, C the composition is that entity. So these are inverse to another to each other. The two operations are inverse to each other. Okay. So of course, the phylogenetic trees are nicer to depict. You, know, you draw a, a, a picture. But this second condition of arboreal coverings, which are a, a collection of partitions of n, that's sometimes easier to work with algebraically. OK, so I will make a five minutes break as usual. Meanwhile, you can, you can prove this. So A and C are quite obvious, but B is a little bit tricky. So maybe you want to think about B, uh, but it's not very difficult either. OK. So Let's have a short break, and then we meet again.
Okay, are you ready? Short break. So now, sorry, I have to. We will prove this, at least in part. So in order to spare space, I have written the construction of B again here. Now, how do we define the graph? The set of vertices we have V, this is index set, N is a set of labels. We take the unions, these are the, will be the inner vertices, the N will be the leaves, and the edges are defined by these two conditions here. Okay. So, oh, we cannot hear you, Eric. Or I cannot hear you. I can't either. But, 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 but now you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Sorry for this. I, I switched on the micro, but apparently I switched it out off again. So thank you for pointing it. So I repeat. Here, you see again the construction of B. The graph gamma consists of word inner vertices V, leaves N, and the edges are defined by these two conditions here. So <clears throat> let me prove this, at least to a certain extent. So going from here to here, that's easy. And we will just do it orally. I hope you see me. I go here. So we have to prove that we get at least three destination sets. That's the first condition. But this vertex will have degree at least three. So we have three ways to, to go out. Note here that we also allow these edges here. Okay, So, in, uh, so we, this is automatic. Uh, we can go to Paris, London, and Berlin, at least. Maybe even to Madrid, or Sevilla, or whatever, where you are. Okay. Now, the next condition, that's the nicest one. That's the geometric condition. So this. If V and we have here U, uh, let us take an, a set here. For instance, we take this set here. No? So we have all these vertices in I. If we take the edge which defined this incident set, or this set here, then the edge has another endpoint, which we call u. And now if you take all these together, here you see it. If you take all these labels together, it will be complementary to this set. And of course, u is unique, because you need all these. Okay, So that's condition two. And condition three is immediate, because the leaves are attached just to a single inner vertex. Okay, So if we take leave here, that's the unique vertex where it is attached. So that's by inspection. Of the picture of the graph. And as you are all professionals and very smart, C is almost obvious, provided B is true. So B is going from this to this here. So we have, to we have to show that the gamma we define here is indeed, is indeed a phylogenetic tree. So B. I'm not sure if I do everything, but this is more delicate and more interesting. So <clears throat> we need a preliminary remark. Observe first that if V, W, and V are, uh, my notation has changed, but have complementary sets. I in IV, J in IW, 
So I, this joint union J is N. Then we can, <coughs> we get the following. Now, this IW, it will have J, and then it will have some further sets k1 up to kp. And it is clear as the union of these is whole n, the union of k1 up to kp will be i, with i equals k1 union kp. Quite clear, no? If you want to see it here, if you take this i here, this will be j, the complement, and it is the union of these three. Okay, here is one missing. Okay, trivial. <clears throat> so there are several things to prove. First, uh, we show, let us show that gamma equals V union NE is a phylogenetic tree. And this goes in several steps. So uh, the first thing is that no vertices of degree 2. So we have two types of vertices, the i's and the v's. So i in n has degree 1 by condition 3. It is attached just to one v. And what about the inner vertices? I have to take a little bit of care. v in v has degree at least 3. Why this is true? Uh, because essentially we have iv at least 3, and for each such element here set inside here, we will get an adjacent, we will get an adjacent vertex. And I, okay, so we see that it has degree at least 3. So I put here a shriek, which means think about it, but it's very easy. Then one thing which is easy to, uh, to forget is we have to prove that gamma is connected. And that's kind of fun. So to prove that it is connected, we just have to prove that if we take i and n, and v in v, then we find a path yeah, sufficient to connect i in n with v in v for any v, any i and v. Okay, So that's precisely if we have v here. And we have i here. We want to construct this path here yeah, by a path in gamma. OK? You agree? So how do we do this? Uh, the, if by chance v and i are as in, in 3 here, then it's clear if i, v are as in 3. Now I have a 
that's not very good because my notation is confusing. I will not call this, let me call this maybe 1 and 2. Sorry. Because otherwise, we will, uh, we'll, I want to refer to this. So if i and v are as in this condition 3, then the path is simple. Then path is just the edge. I, V. If not, if not, then I will not be a singleton of V. Then I in I, and this will belong to I, V with i at least 2. I have to take care. Yeah. Now, as we have this v, we can choose. So now comes the tricky part. That's the nice thing. So let me, here we have v, and here we have our i. OK. What we want to do is we want to find this path here. And to do so, we will specify this vertex u here. Once we know this u, yeah, then we, and we know how to connect u with i, then we just add this edge, and we are done. Okay. So how do we find this u? Yeah, this goes as follows. <coughs> Ta -da Choose u in v which is precisely the, with uh, j, we take the complement of i in i u. So this, if you think about it, as small i is in i, this will define this vertex here. OK. Now, by the observation, by the remark, we can write i equals k1 kp, the kl are in i uh, u. And of course, uh, the kl will be strictly contained in i. Because uh, of condition one, think about it. Okay, so now we will find an, that I belongs to one of these. Hence, I in K one without loss of generality. Yeah, because I is in I, so it must be K one. Now K one has smaller cardinality as k1 has cardinality less than i, we can connect u to i by a pass, yeah, by induction. On the size of i. And then it just, once we have u, add the edge v to f to the path. Then add the edge uv to the path. Do you see? So that's <clears throat> typical type of argument where we actually, we just look at the picture and we we decide what we have to do here, because we know already. The difficult thing is to guess that this could be true. But once you have this picture, it's immediate how you apply induction. No? You go from, in order to go from v to i, you have to you use this u. And how do you specify the u? You specify the u by this property. OK? And the final thing, can I erase here already? I'm not sure if you have copied this. 
So the, the final thing is to show that we have no loops. So that's also kind of nice. Now I erase. I, leak, I keep this. <coughs> So if you have a little bit of time, uh, I know that you're all very busy, but it's much more fun if you try to do this proof again at home without looking, without looking at what I have written. Yeah. So the third condition, gamma has no loops. So maybe I, I be short here. Uh, let me assume, let me do it again by drawing. Assume that we have a, a loop like this. If gamma would look like this. So where do we get a contradiction? Assume we have a closed path. So we start here. We go in this direction, we go like this, we go like this. So let me call this here V. Now this one is breaking down in W. So what we will do to show that there are no loops, we will order, we will order adjacent vertices totally. And as we are in a finite set, we cannot have loops. Yeah? So v will be larger than w, and w will be larger than u, and then here we get a contradiction. And how do we measure this? So we have here i v, and we have I w, we choose I here, we choose J here, which are complementary. That's possible because these two are adjacent. Okay. And then we write I as K1 union KP KI in I W. So now the KI Kj are strictly contained in I. Okay? So when we go from here to here, yeah, we, will, we will get a partition of I by smaller sets of I by smaller sets. Now here this edge here, it cannot correspond to j, because j was already used here. So it must be one of these kj, yeah, which gives the edge here. So continuing, we now get, uh, let me call it, uh, here we have i and j, and then we have a certain kj and maybe an lj, which is complementary. So repeating. we get along the closed path a decreasing sequence of sets. The first one will be i, which I call i1, i1. And then the next one will be this kj. The j depends where we continue, of course. 
which I call I2, and then we go on I3, and so on. And this gives a contradiction, because when we end up at I, we are contradiction. Okay, So this does not work. So <clears throat> I have a little bit of time. So are you happy with this? Is it too, too detailed? Uh, I want, after the first lemma, I want to come to the first proposition. And maybe I even have time to prove part of it. We have some 20 minutes. So actually, there are many more characterizations of phylogenetic trees, at least five. All are combinatorial. And there are even books on phylogenetic trees where you can find some of these characterizations and also where you find much more material and generalizations of phylogenetic trees. Okay, so let's continue, if there are no questions. Uh, proposition. Yeah, that's, that's a very strange proposition. We just take two n-gons, let x, y in p1n two n-gons with at least three pairwise distinct entries. Otherwise, we are, we are completely stuck. Uh, that's our constant condition. And equal cross ratios whenever defined. So we are inside, yeah, OK. We don't need strings at the moment. We just need n-gons, OK? Then we want to know when these two are PGL2 equivalent, define the same orbit. And this is equivalent that the incidence partitions ix is equal to iy. And recall, these were the indices, the labels where x, i are the same. Yeah. And here is something which is really surprising. This is also equivalent that they have a non-empty intersection. Do it means that there exists i <laughs> incidence set? for both x and y. So if one incidence set coincides, then x and y are already PGL2 equivalent. Okay, And of course, then all incidence sets coincide. Let me write this like this. Let me draw x maybe like this. And y and let me draw the incident sets. For simplicity, I group them so that they are together. Now, maybe the first one is different, but the, this yeah, like this, and then you have the same one. Here you have i. And here you have i. They should be the same. It doesn't look like, but you understand what I mean. Yeah? I repeat, if here the xi's are all the same and distinct to the other ones outside, 
And if you have here the same segment or the same entry, I, I wrote them one after the other to simplify, no? then x and y are already PGL2 equivalent. So I hope that I can prove this. At least I will prove, I will prove this implication. Okay. Proof. Uh, now, one and two. So this direction, if they are equivalent, then the incidence that was already clear. So we only have to go backwards. So interesting is this one and this one. Okay. And uh, we will do today only this one because we don't have time for all. And Next time we will do this one, or you try to do it on your own. That's easier than this one. So let us do proof this direction for two. So if they have one same incident set, then all are equal. OK. So. <clears throat> i is in this partition ix. And we know that we have at least three sets. Choose k, sorry, choose jx and kx distinct in ix uh, to further incidence sets. of x. Now of course these are will be they will be distinct and they are also distinct from i. Yeah. Now we show we show only half, but this will be sufficient. There exists a j in i y with i contained in J. This is sufficient. Is sufficient by symmetry. No? Because interchanging the role of I and J, we know that J will be contained in an incident set of X, but this must be then equal to I because we have partitions. Okay? This is sufficient. So <clears throat> as i was arbitrary, we will get this condition. OK? Yeah. Uh, do I write this implies i equal j? No, 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 I'm stupid. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. Here I want to write jy, and I want not i, but I want here jy, and here I want jx. I know already that i belongs to ix and to iy, yes? But I take another one, and I show that the other one is contained in the jy belonging to iy. And then we have equality jx. Okay? And as jx was arbitrary, we get this condition, this condition here. OK? Sorry, I was mistaken. What about my time? Yes, it's OK. So how do we do? Choose, that's now pure combinatorics, i in i j in jx, k in kx, l in jx, l different j. So it suffices to show that 
x j equal x l sorry y y j equals y l. So, y let me repeat l and j belong both to j x. So, x j is equal to x l. If we prove that y l is also y, this is a j here. I am, I am now I am totally confused. Let me write it down properly. y j equals y l. Once we prove this, we can now vary L and J, and we get the inclusion that J exists in JY. In some incidence set, because all these, whenever XJ is equal to XL, we get YJ equal to YL. Okay. Nothing difficult behind. Now we have to use the cross ratios. Okay. So. By definition and by our choice, by definition of our sets, we have the following. Xi is different xj. xj is equal to xl. This is different to xk. And this is, in turn, different from xi. So we now choose the cross ratio carefully. Of course, we take q equals ij kl in n over 4. This is a quadruple. And we compare and use that the cross ratio with respect to q of x is the cross ratio with respect to q of y. So as these two are equal, this one is 0. This was our characterization before. Since xj equals xl, we have two equal values. So we have a special value of the cross ratio. Now, what about this one? There are two options. Either this one is not defined if the cross uy is not defined, then we must have three equal. But we know that yi, i belongs also to iy. So then with us, we have yi, which is different from all others, yeah, because uh, uh, by construction, yj, yk, yl, yeah, because i is in iy. Okay. So then this condition implies that these three must be equal, yj equals yk equals yl. And that's what we wanted to prove, yj equals yl. OK. If cross ratio qy is defined, then we cannot have three equal values. Then we must have <coughs> uh, then we use then cross qy is zero. And hence now remember this is zero if either yj equals yl or yi equals yk. But this here is excluded. Since i in i and k not in i. So we have this. OK. And as I have five minutes left, let me prove also the second part. Uh, let us prove. This goes very fast now. Let us prove 1. Now we assume that all incidence sets are equal. And we want to prove that x and y are PGL2 equivalent. So we did not use yet one assumption that they have three distinct entries. 
So, assume i y equals i x. So all incident sets are equal. So x and y have at least three different entries, and they have them at this uh, pairwise different, and they have them at the same places because because these two are equal. So up to permutation of our label set capital N and up to the PGL2 action, we have, without loss of generality, uh, x1 different x2 different x3 different x1 and y1 different y2 different y3 different y1. OK. Now you use PGL2. Uh, x is equivalent to 0, 1, infinity, x prime. And y is equivalent to 0, 1, infinity on the first three entries, and then some y prime, x prime, y prime in p1, n minus 3. OK? But they have the equal cost ratio. So uh, equality of cross ratios. So if we take, for instance, if you take here, let me call this x prime 4 here, the first entry here. If you take the cross ratio with respect to 0, 1, infinity, and the first one, it must be the same as here. But as these ones are fixed, we get x prime equals y prime. Okay. This was the formula. Now if you have 0, 1, and infinity at three places, then the last one is determined. The fourth entry is determined by the cross ratio. So we are done. Okay. So you see a little bit how we are going. That's the type of argument. Next type, we will prove uh, more uh, facts like this. We will show uh, <clears throat> that actually we get from strings in Yn, we will get phylogenetic trees. Okay. So that's all for today. I hope you can enjoy a little bit. I wish you a wonderful evening. And I am happy if we meet again in one week. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye.